Welcome everybody to Stern's third annual FinTech conference. We're so excited that you're all here. Thank you for coming. I think we've got an amazing day and you're going to have a lot of fun. So I'm Kathleen DeRose. I'm a professor here in the finance department and I'm one of the many champions of FinTech here at Stern. So I'm here to kick it off. We have a great day. So why do we have a picture of lava lamps? So they were a feature in college dorms at some point. This is the randomness wall, the entropy wall, at Cloud Fair in San Francisco. And they literally train a video camera on this wall and use it, the movement of those lava lamps, as their randomness kernel for their cryptographic protocols for their internet business. That's pretty cool, right? Why am I showing you this? Well, randomness is this cool feature of both data science and fintech. We have it in both finance and analytical systems. And that's what this whole conference is about. It's about data disruption in, fin in fintech and how these two fields are converging. So we've moved well beyond the very beginnings of fintech and we're starting to see the emergence of real platforms in finance. And in fact, we may even be at the point where Venmo gets Venmoed. So fintech started with a really simple idea, right? that you could rebuild any of our major financial systems with simple things like mobile networks, API plugins, and open source software. Today we've moved well beyond that to things like this, where we can do analytics on unstructured or unlabeled data, where we can unbundle and like this company, Stash Invest here in New York, offer investment services for an entry price of just $5. We're able to do collaborative and subjective tasks in an automated way. One of the companies here today, Dream Forward, automates 401k advice with a chatbot. This allows us to unearth hidden dimensions. I borrowed this picture from the head of data science from Ant Financial. The point he was making was that you can unearth latent dimensions, like the fact that people who are skinny jeans sit on their iPhones and break them. I ask you if that's monetizable. Well, when I told this story to the head of a major insurance company here in New York, he said, I'm running down the hall to tell my underwriters who insure iPhones about this problem. We're also able now to better match, potentially, financial products and services with people who use them. I would be remiss if I was standing here and I didn't start to celebrate a little bit some of the fintech programs we have here at Stern. We're really excited to be considered one of the leading fintech programs offering full courses to undergrads, MBAs, and starting next year, online courses and also executive MBA programs. And we're really pre pleased and I would like to highlight or maybe brag a little bit about the fact that one recent survey ranked us ahead of both Harvard and MIT in FinTech. Yay, that's cool. We're also really excited to be thought leaders in FinTech research. So one of the cool things about today is that you'll get to hear some leading researchers, not only here at NYU, but from around the world, who are studying the latest problems in data science and in FinTech. And that's really exciting. It's really exciting because FinTech raises all these cool challenges like how behavior will change and be reshaped by FinTech advice or how businesses might transform because of fintech. Or lastly, policy implications of fintech, like maybe for the first time we actually get a chance to reduce intermediation costs. That's pretty exciting. The third area of emphasis for us here at Stern and fintech is ecosystem events like this. So we think this is a really cool opportunity because it's one of the only conferences in New York that brings together people from academia and from the commercial world. And that's a huge opportunity for you guys to enjoy yourselves and network. Most importantly though, what we're most proud of is that we're reaching so many students around the world through these programs and helping them shape their future and adapt to a world where technology is really transforming business and our lives. I want to sp say a special thank you to the Fubon Center that's the host of this event. And the Fubon Center was formed this year thanks to a very generous donation from an alumni. And it's intended to sponsor research at the intersection 
of innovation, technology, and society. So thank you very much to them. I'd also like to give a shout out to our sponsors. We have five of them, their names are on the board. We're very, very grateful for this. We are a nonprofit, and this does enable us to reach more people, so thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the many people who made this conference possible. You know who you are. It takes a tremendous amount of work to do these things, and um, you'll have a chance to meet many of them running around, including our MBA FinTech Club and the Assistant Director of the Fubon Center. So thank you to them. A few notes on logistics. So we have a very full day. Uh, the morning, we have an amazing keynote, who I'll kick it off to in just a second. We have two academic panels, and you'll get to hear some of the latest research in blockchain and other things. Then we have uh, a very cool lunch event where you'll get a chance to have uh, table topics and talk about various subjects. You can pick the one you're interested in, or you can just hang out and have a sandwich and network. The afternoon is also chock-a-block. We've got demo sessions, we've got two more panels, and we have a closing keynote and champagne reception at the end. So make sure to stick around for that. Uh, the all-important bathrooms are to the right on this floor, and there's another one downstairs. And uh, I hope you really, really enjoy the day, and most importantly, enjoy participating and meeting and greeting all the various people here. So have a great time. And now, if Matt's here, I can turn it over to him for our keynote address. Is Matt here? So Matt Harris is one of the leading uh, fintech VCs here in the city. He's a managing director of Bain Capital Ventures, and he'll be our keynote speaker in just a moment. Oh, I can hey, share hey. my name. Hey. Yeah, good. <laughs> we ran a tight ship here. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, welcome Great very much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. I know I'm you, delighted to be here. You give amazing talks, and you tell us all about what's going on in fintech wow, right now. No so pressure. we're super excited to have right. you here. And there Thank you. Go. you. Thanks. I appreciate okay. it. I'm yeah. thrilled to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me again. Um, so. Uh, for better or for worse, I did this last year, as mentioned, and really went through almost all my content. Uh, so I've had to kind of develop some new tricks, which I'm going to demo on you all, and we're going to hope it works out. Um, so I'm going to go light on what I talked about last year, uh, which is basically kind of history of venture capital in fintech. We've got some of the slides, and we'll touch on it for those who aren't familiar with that material. But uh, I want to talk about three things primarily. Um, so we'll take as a given that venture capital world has discovered fintech. Um, so let's go a level deeper here today uh, on one, what are the frameworks we use at Bain Capital Ventures to think about the different sub-segments of fintech? I'm just going to choose two examples to give you a sense for how we think about a couple facets of this uh, multifaceted segment. Uh, two, what are the current trends right now? So that was stuff I didn't talk about last year because things have changed pretty quickly. And I'm going to kind of whip through a bunch of different trends for you to take away. And then obviously you'll have access to this material if anything prompts your interest further. And then finally, I have a few slides and really some early thinking on the future. Um, and you know, as you'll hear throughout the talk, I have some concerns about FinTech's continued growth. Um, but yet, I think I have a way forward to where I can you know, maintain employment for a few more years uh, and continue to find interesting things to invest in. So I'll talk about that. So that's my agenda here today. I remember vividly from last year that I gave my talk, and then there were a few minutes remaining, and I opened it up for questions. And that's where things got really interesting. So I'm not going to make that same mistake. I'm going to keep my remarks contained. Uh, a little bit more than last year and leave us more time for Q&A. Um, class participation will be part of your final grade. So I do recommend that you start thinking of interesting questions now. Um, and, uh, and away we go. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about Bank Capital Ventures and the industry overview, and then do this deep dive into sub-segments and talk a little bit about the future. Uh, who are we? So Bain Capital is a big alternative asset management firm. Just hit $100 million here this year. $100 billion, did I say million? Um, $100 million is more like what I do at most. So we're the smallest part of Bain Capital. We run the Ventures Group. Um, we invest about three or $400 million a year. And we do half early stage. I, you know, I've done two or three seed investments a year for the past six years. So we do a lot of seed investing. We do a lot of Series A investing. Leading Series A's is fully 40% of what we do. And then another 50% is growth equity. 
25 to $100 million investments in companies that are scaling. But still, from an AUM perspective, that puts us um, on the small end of things at Bain Capital. Uh, we've had a pretty good run. I have to say the whole venture industry has had a pretty good run, so we can't claim to be unique in this. But you know, a, a bunch of IPOs here in the past year. DocuSign is a company that we're very proud of. Um, SendGrid, we just merged with Twilio this week. Um, a bunch of other scale companies over time. Uh, and again, generally, if we're doing it right, we're really getting into these companies at the Series A if we can. FinTech has been very active. So we've invested about $100 million a year in financial technology for the past five years. Uh, I started my career at Bain Capital in 1995. Uh, back when it was a relatively small private equity firm. Uh, I left and started my own firm in 2000, a firm called Village Ventures, to do nothing but early stage fintech, which was uh, really a, a mistake at the time. I mean, I really, fintech was not a sector, and despite my earnest wishes, it did not become a sector for seven or eight years. So I spent that time kind of wandering in the wilderness, uh, trying to learn what I could about payments and lending and capital markets and insurance, um, but ended up being well positioned in 07, 08 when the industry started to pick up. And then I came back to Bain Capital when the industry started to kind of go bonkers and represent 10% of the venture capital industry. And I really wanted a bigger platform than, than Village. Um, and so for the past uh, five years now, six years now, I've been running the New York office for Bain Capital Ventures and doing all these fintech investments, which you see here. And you also see our, our framework. Um, payments is you know, the bulk of what we've done, certainly by dollar and, and more or less by logo. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what we like there. Um, it's also historically been the bulk of what made up fintech. It certainly represented the first uh, activity that really picked up steam within fintech, really the founding of Square is kind of what I point to as the birth of, of modern fintech. And if you go back before Square, and you were to ask yourself, you know, in 2000, when I started looking at this, what are the set of financial services activities that take place outside of regulated institutions? The only real answer at scale was payments. In the 90s, the banks, for a variety of reasons, decided, in most cases, to more or less exit payments to stay in it sometimes through joint ventures with companies like First Data, but in many cases to just spin out their payments units altogether. Um, and so that, you know, and, and one of the metrics you can think about in FinTech is what percent of economic activity across these four boxes is done by the regulated incumbent and what percent is done by the technology enabled insurgent. Uh, payments was the first to move, you know, it was fully 25%, by the time Square was founded, it was already 25 to 30% non-bank relative to bank. And the report just came out last week that it's over 50% non-bank relative to bank in payments. And so one of the existential questions that, that I think a lot about is will that happen in other segments? Will you know, broker-dealers retreat in investing and, and non-regulated incumbents take market share Will non-bank lenders take that kind of market share in the, in the credit space from banks, et cetera, and so on and so forth, and insurance? So uh, I happen to generally believe no is the answer to that, but it obviously is very nuanced by category. So um, very active in payments, very interested in investing, defined broadly, so institutional and retail, asset management, wealth management, marketplaces. We'll talk more about our frameworks there. Definitely missed lending uh, relatively deliberately. I had been the first investor, went on to become chairman of a company called On Deck Capital here, here in New York. Small business lender, now a public company. And um, we, we invested from Village at a $2.5 million valuation, and it's worth $600 million today. And it was a great experience, therefore, you know, financially. But it, it round tripped through about $2 billion in value which makes it a lot less fun. If you, if you sort of go straight line from two and a half to 600, that, that's, a, that's a good time. Um, round tripping through two billion changes the, the dynamics of that experience, particularly as a public company. Um, and basically it was an incredibly hard education for me about how difficult it is to build a lending company as a non-bank without access to really inexpensive capital and a regulatory apparatus. So, 
I sort of was, have been gun shy about that. Defy and Ribbon represent really technology companies in and around lending, but not lenders per se. And then insurance, we've, we've had some success. Square Trade was a company that we sold to Allstate for $1.4 billion in 2017. Uh, we have three companies that we're still very excited about. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about emerging opportunities in insurance. So that's us. Um, I promised some frameworks. I don't know if that was met with glee, but I did promise them, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about them. Um, so this is what we, kinda, what we like to do. And we, we do it across all the segments that we invest in. We really try to boil down to first principles what's going on in an industry. And in fact, you know, we have a distinct reluctance to invest in horizontal technology companies because this is the way we approach the world. We approach the world with saying, like, what are the problems to be solved in an industry value chain? And a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, and certainly a lot of other VCs, ask a different kind of question. They ask a kind of question like, what are the problems that a blockchain could solve? Or what are the problems that exist in the world that lend themselves to machine learning? And that is never a question we would ask. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of people have had great success, certainly raising capital, with ideas like that. Because people tend to get captivated by horizontal technology. We're captivated more by market dynamics and business problems. And so this is useful for us, where we think about, OK, let's, what's a, a very simple schematic, simplistic even, of the investing world? You've got you know, real money investors, people who actually have money that's theirs, that they want to invest. It's the retail, from high net worth to millennials with you know, $14.72. But you've got a lot of you know, individuals with money and institutions with money. They tend to work with advisors. We think of this generally as wealth management. Those advisors frequently buy products from asset managers. We think of that you know, as asset management as distinct from wealth management. In order to execute on that intention to get a financial exposure, you've generally got to work with a broker. And that broker, he or she, uh, actually acquires that exposure for you on some kind of marketplace, generally. Particularly, I would say now, where there's less broker to broker, or what they call over the counter type trading, and more and more things are being traded on venues and marketplaces. So that's sort of how we approach every investment in the investing box of what we do. And then we do surely think about enabling technology. I mentioned analytics as, as, as a pullout within the broader frame of infrastructure and, and enabling technology underneath investing. And so, you know, these are the logos uh, of our companies kind of arrayed on that framework. Um, and we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about some select examples where we've placed our bets. Um, but I, I will I, I emphasize the framework because we find it very useful internally. Obviously, our actual work is let's find great entrepreneurs and give them capital. But it turns out the hard part about that is actually winning the deal. This is not necessarily commonly the view of venture capital. But I would say the critical success factor of all the firms that you know, we hold in such high regard is that when they want to do a deal, they more or less get to do it. Uh, and in this environment, which is so fiercely competitive with so many firms at every stage, that is really not true for the average firm. So the question isn't really so much discernment. It isn't, oh, of all the companies I've met, which one is the winner? Very frequently, if you're sort of half on the ball, you kind of get that part reasonably right. It's about, can I get into that deal? And our way of getting into deals is by sitting down with entrepreneurs with our frameworks and saying, hey, where are we right? Where are we wrong? Here's how we think about you. And here's how we think, therefore, about your competitors, companies you should partner with, talent you should meet. And frequently, we're wrong. But always, we set ourselves apart from our competition by having a priori thought about where they fit into the landscape. So that's why we do stuff like this. And also, we like it. It's fun. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about a couple. So transactions take place in marketplaces and venues. Uh, and IEX is an example of that. IEX is a US equities exchange. They compete with New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. They are way behind those two big firms. They have about 2.5% market share relative to those guys who split up between them, call it you know, almost all the rest. There's a third 
uh, venue called Bats, which has, depending on the day, 10 to 15% market share. So this is a real uh, long shot story when we did it as the first institutional investor. Um, but it's been a fun one. They have taken this thesis that high frequency trading is bad for markets and let's try to create a marketplace where high frequency traders have uh, as much access as they want, but no access to unfair advantage. Um, and so they've gone from you know, zero to 250 basis points in the four years we've been an investor. They just launched their first listing, which is another thing that venues and marketplaces do. They transferred a $22 billion company from NASDAQ over to IEX as a listing venue. So we've been really excited about that. Um, and it certainly goes into the uh, audacity category of what we do, uh, which is to say massively high likelihood of failure at the very outset, which is another thing we've come to, to look for in our investments at the Series A stage is active embracing of risk and entrepreneurs who have the kind of ambition that makes them sound Silly almost. I mean, if you, and I did, in our diligence, we talked to 72 market participants, and we asked them, not as a core question, but as an ancillary question, what are the odds that you would give IEX of being able to enter the listings business? Which BATS, which has been around nearly 20 years, does not have a corporate listings business. They have an ETF listings business. Uh, and out of 72 people, zero of them gave them even 1% chance. Um, and the guy did it, you know, two weeks ago. So. We like entrepreneurs who have crazy ideas as long as they have the heft to back them up. And generally, we risk manage that approach through check size. We do, the, we do crazy at the Series A. We generally don't put $75 million into crazy. Uh, and maybe we should. Maybe that's the way to really make outsized returns. But uh, we are bank capital, after all. Um, so I'll mention uh, a few others. In the, you know, we, we believe strongly that Asset management and wealth management are changing and changing quickly, but in different ways. You could argue that the revolution that is happening in wealth management, the advisory, has already happened in asset management, which is the manufacturing of products. If you look at iShares, BlackRock, and you look at Vanguard, they are massively low-cost, beta-oriented institutions. They basically say to investors, we will get you reliably and faithfully the returns, the exposures you want for incredibly cheap. And that has taken over the world of asset management. The, the sort of alpha crowd is really struggling. The active investment crowd is really struggling relative to the performance net of fees of the passive guys. That has not yet fully invaded the wealth management space. Wealth management average fees are still 100 basis points. And the track record of advisors adding alpha is just as poor, if not more poor, given their conflicts frequently, as that of the wealth management industry, of the asset management industry. So it's same exact dynamic, and the revolution has not yet happened. Robo advising, digital wealth, the sort of inexpensive beta proposition on the advisory segment is in its infancy. It has about 50 basis points of the entire market of all the assets that are advised. 50 basis points are advised under this method of objective, inexpensive, beta-oriented, digitally derived advice. Um, I don't know how quickly that's going to change, but it is striking given how fast we've moved on the manufacturing side. So those are a few observations against this framework. Again, I'm happy to chat about any one of these companies in the, in the Q&A. Um, Let's talk about insurance. Insurance is, is even more multifaceted. You have a value chain similar to the one we showed where you have the capital comes generally historically from reinsurance companies who just want, just want the risk, financially speaking, and partner with the carriers to share that risk with them. Uh, you have carriers who are regulated institutions in the United States, state by state, who have the reserves and actually in the eyes of the regulators and the customers are the ones owning the risk of the outcome. Uh, you have an increasingly popular category called an MGA, managing general agent, sort of hybrid of a carrier and a broker. Certain amount of discretion over how much risk they're willing to take and able to take and so therefore they can innovate around product. And then you have brokers who more or less take the products that are built by carriers and sometimes MGAs and distribute them historically on storefronts, and more and more online and through apps. So that's the value chain. But within insurance, we've got health insurance, we've got 
the wealth categories, annuities, life, et cetera, and we've got the property and casualty area, that, you know, sort of the risk categories like auto and home, three very different businesses. Many companies do two of those three. Some do all three, fewer and fewer, and fewer even do two. You're seeing more specialization amongst carriers about what they think they're good at and where their brands can take them. Uh, and then finally, you've got the same kind of underpinnings of infrastructure needed by all segments. Uh, and you, you're orienting this entire value chain in these three very different businesses against different customer types. The enterprise, large businesses buy insurance very differently than the middle market, and then again, very differently than the small business market, and obviously consumers both need different coverages and buy them very differently. So I think the, you know, generally speaking, if you ask people what is hot in FinTech right now, they will say InsureTech. InsureTech Connect, which is sort of the conference in the space, was sold out three weeks ago with 6,000 people in Vegas talking about insurance. Uh, and that's new in the world. I mean, that really, that's a new thing. Insurance was very slow to change. It is, it has a regulatory chassis here in the United States, as mentioned, that is very difficult to move against given its fragmented nature, even compared to payments and lending and investing, it is really hard. And it has much of the same balance sheet challenge that a lending company does, depending on where you are in this value chain. But there are so many opportunities against this matrix that entrepreneurs are really stimulated by the possibilities. And it's an industry where your sort of average NPS is quite low. They're not customers walking around delighted by the service they're getting, generally from the incumbent. So those things, you know, unhappy customers, big, big markets, incumbents that are loath to change has gotten the entrepreneurial zeal really revved up. So you're seeing a lot here. Uh, what have we done? We have done a consumer-oriented MGA in the, in the property casualty space. So that's, again, I'm using the green here to kind of highlight the facets of this industry where we've played. This is Square Trade. They basically observed that the warranty space, when you buy something relatively expensive, you get offered a warranty. That, that component of insurance had not innovated in a long time. They built a modern warranty player focused on electronics. And again, Allstate found that valuable enough to, to buy it here last year. And why did they do that? Because a billion four is a big number, even, even for a large company. I think they did it because they're really worried about auto. If you think about, if you're in the boardroom of a carrier right now, like an Allstate or a State Farm or Farmers or Chubb, AIG, et cetera, they're looking at auto with a great deal of confusion and trepidation right now. There's a few things happening that you can already see, which is that uh, severity of accidents is climbing significantly due to texting. So you're seeing like cars go straight into trees without skid marks. Like you're seeing accidents that would have been fender benders turning into multiple fatalities, and that's accelerating, and there's not much they can do about it, and that is risk that they own completely, and with no ability to lay that off on anyone. So auto is getting worse, severity is getting worse, um, and you also have this looming threat of autonomous vehicles. And in the end state, and you can all have your own views about timing, but in the end state, auto insurance becomes a product liability, not a driving question. And so there's literally no need for auto insurance at some point in the future when you are not driving the car that you're in. And so they have this incredible pickle of the business is getting worse now and is going away in the future. And they are thinking of ways to future-proof themselves. Even if they're confident that that future is far away, um, they have been stimulated into activity primarily, I think, by the degradation and long-term fears in their auto insurance, and, and Square Trade was the beneficiary of that. JustWorks is a company here in New York, uh, a company that I work on that I just love working with. It was founded to help small businesses manage their benefits. It's what's called a PEO. So they, are, they do worker comp as well as health benefits, and they are a broker or an MGA, depending on what line of insurance you're talking about. They serve, um, on average, eight to 10 employee businesses. And it's one of those companies, I'd love to say this about all my companies, I can say it without any hesitation about JustWorks, it is the very best answer for a small company. It combines payroll and benefits and compliance 
um, in a delightful package, which is less expensive than any competitor. They've grown from zero to 60-ish million dollars in revenue in three and a half years and continue to just absolutely skyrocket. And at last count, they have over 1% of all sm small businesses you know, in their relevant SIC codes in New York City. So if you're starting a company, I recommend JustWorks. Um, and we're doing more in benefits. We have had a great experience with JustWorks. We think there's more to do taking on competitors, not just like they are trying at an ADP, but also companies like WageWorks and Health Equity. And again, here's a methodology we use internally. Where is their market cap in companies that no customer likes? Screen the public companies by market cap and ask yourself, do their customers like them? And where you find a concentration of unloved, valuable companies, that's a great opportunity. Um, finally, Corvus, a seed stage deal, a great entrepreneur, commercial insurance guy. We built at MGA in commercial insurance focused on uh, sensors, basically. So everything has sensors now. We, you know, people talk about this as Internet of Things. Um, but as mentioned, I don't really like those horizontal buzzwords, so I'm going to use sensors. But the fact is, it's a thing. Like, Every cargo shipment now has sensors that tell you where it went, what the temperature and humidity was, was the box open, was there exposure to light, was there tampering. That, those sensors are used for mainly regulatory purposes, like for food, for the FDA, for high value life sciences. No one's using them for insurance. And so Phil built a new to the world marine cargo policy that leveraged that sensor data and built an exclusive relationship with all the sensor companies. And now he's out in market as of June, after a you know, million dollar seed from us, in market selling marine cargo insurance through brokers. And he's just launched a new cyber policy that similarly leverages sensors and data in a way that represents this hybrid of tech and proper insurance that we're really excited about. Um, so that, you know, that gives you a sense for what, who we are, what we like, a little bit of a set of heuristics we use to do what we do in venture and growth equity. And then finally, some more detailed frameworks, just pulling out two different sub-segments and giving you a sense for how we, in the abstract, think about the industries we play in. But let's zoom up a little bit and talk, again, briefly about fintech. You can see from this chart, uh, things have gotten bigger. So this. This is where I started my career, uh, what I call the doldrums, uh, where my wife was embarrassed to admit what I did for a living. Um, and then you can see things pick up. And in the far right bar, that's a partial year number, that 13.6. So they will, this year will be the biggest year ever, even if you exclude that checked you know, component, which represents Ant Financial and, and Anbang. And there is certainly, they should be included. China, in many senses, is where FinTech is really happening and at a fever pitch. But even if you exclude it, this will be another record year. And as a percent of the venture business, way up in the high single digits, conservatively measured. Um, if you look at the exits, this is a brand new chart, a brand new looking chart from a year ago, where the wave of IPOs has really started in FinTech. Prior to last year's conference, we had a couple lending IPOs, and you had Square Public, but we've had payments IPOs, additional lending IPOs that have gone better, incrementally better, um, and a way healthier story. Some SaaS companies like Avalara and Coupa that are financial technology software companies for CFOs, uh, a, a really robust ca category. So we're seeing a way better exit picture. Um, though, and again, this data is sort of granular, but the average valuations at exit and the aggregate value of the exits, so far, if it were to continue, would not be enough to justify the money that's gone in. That's just the takeaway here, is that if you look at the velocity of money going into FinTech, the belief amongst me and my peers implicitly is that the future is better than the present, that notwithstanding how robust that IPO picture has looked and the $67.5 billion, that has been generated, it needs to get even better. If you're putting $20 billion a year into a segment, that 20 has to turn into 60. So that 60 has to become an annual rate of liquidity up against those investments. And by the way, we don't buy whole companies. So that $20 billion a year is going on average to maybe buy a quarter to a third of the company. So our quarter to a third that we're paying $20 billion worth has to turn into 60, which means that 
you have to have a quarter trillion dollars a year of annual liquidity in fintech for this whole thing to, in aggregate, have been worth it. And I would be delighted if that happened. But uh, as a betting man, I would say you wouldn't want to just sort of buy the index fund of that set of companies. Um, the nuances here by industry, I, I have forced to separate digital currency as a category because it's gotten so big. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting observations about these charts. Most, I think, what jumps out to me is payments is shrinking as a percent. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. This is dramatically true at the early stage. I would say the incidence of payment startups these days, again, we have some data that I think is probably not comprehensive, but definitely directionally way off. And what we see is that the, the talent, the entrepreneurs and engineers who would have been starting payments companies are now starting crypto companies. Um, a and B, you actually have scale incumbents like Stripe Square, ADN, PayPal, who are really good companies. Their NPS scores are not the NPS scores of, I'm not going to pick anyone by name, but you know, the old school payments companies who used to not delight their business, their business customers. So uh, payments may be kind of over. It certainly has plateaued and now is starting to shrink. And um, here, here we show this by B2C versus B2B. And again, as I promised, I'll go a little quickly through this. Um, but as we get more into the details, you'll see that lending, shrinking, payments, plateaued and shrinking, investing steady, insurance climbing for now. But frankly, of the segments, it looks most like lending in terms of its balance sheet and regulatory complexity. And so I have some concerns about these core four segments. Um, and I'll come back at the end to where I think I might, I might be able to, to fish us out of the soup and find fun stuff to do for another couple decades. Um, so in interest of time, I'm actually not going to go deep into these trends. You have this materials. Um, I think they speak for themselves. My, my colleague Ashley, who I think is here, did an incredible job working with me on these materials. So there's lots of sub-themes. There's lots of data. This is the payments companies. Um, and there's some good stuff going on in vertical payments. I, I encourage you to look through this if you're curious about fintech. But I want to quickly get to how I think we can take this whole thing forward. And then I want to open it up for questions. Um, lending, shrinking, public stocks and lending, not great. I see an Affirm t-shirt up there. I commonly note Affirm as one of the exceptions. Um, point of sale lending, I think, is still a very interesting business where that phenomena of dissatisfied customers and incumbents that are under siege technology being a differentiator really does matter. Um, investing using active management shrink, institutions bypassing asset managers. This is fascinating. I can't skip over this. So everybody I know in consumer fintech right now is starting a bank. It's unbelievable how many companies are launching a checking account in Q4 of this year or Q1 of next year. By my count, nearly 50. Some large companies like Square, SoFi, um, Lending Club, et cetera, and then all of these young companies like Acorns and Stash and, and Robinhood and Venmo, obviously sort of a hybrid of large and small, um, and on and on, Moneyline, et cetera. There, the market will be flooded with fire your bank messages in the next six months in a way it hasn't been since 10 years ago when Bank Simple got started with that same message. And Bank Simple was, I was, uh, on the board of that company and chairman as well, which we sold for a great return, but it is a cautionary tale in that we didn't actually get a lot of people to fire their bank. Um, but these companies think they will, and the tech is so much better now that they might. And I think the critical distinction actually beyond the tech is that they have customers. Acorns, one of our companies, has 4 million customers who registered their payment cards with Acorns. Well, we know a lot about these people and we can say to them, hey, you've, you've been charged $180 in overdraft so far this year by Bank of America. We can get you a card that admittedly doesn't have branches, which you never go into, but doesn't have overdraft, and is delightfully integrated with all the other tech, our IRA, everything you do at Acorns. And so do they have a chance? I think they have a great chance. But again, this would be very new to the world if people start firing their banks. A uh, bunch of stuff on insurance, and here we go. So I have this ongoing tussle with my partners about real estate. 
Because in fact, if you think about where dollars have gone in fintech, where the rapid growth has been, it's been in real estate. Only problem being that real estate isn't fintech. So that's a little bit of a thing. But I, you know, this came to a head first time when I brought WeWork to the investment committee for an investment four years ago and got shot down. And part of the argument was, I mean, there are many arguments about WeWork at that stage, why it wasn't obvious. But one of the arguments was, what do you know about real estate? You're a fintech guy. You know, that's how our partnership works. And I, you know, I like it. But um, it did make me resolve to think harder about that objection and, and why I sort of felt like I, I kind of knew what I was talking about, even though I have to acknowledge that real estate is not fintech. And it's because most of the problems in real estate are fintech problems. And this is an extremely self-serving analysis. Uh, and there are some problems in real estate that are not fintech problems, like the problem of how do you use advanced cameras to visualize an apartment and then do a listing that's more immersive is not a fintech problem. But all of the payments problems that exist in real estate are important. The lending problems around the mortgage process and the home equity process and the equity extraction process in real estate, title insurance, home insurance, renter's insurance, these are fintech problems that I understand really well that I've spent my career getting smart about and applying them to a vertical does make some sense, notwithstanding the fact that I have and had a bunch to learn about residential and commercial real estate. And then we look at crypto, where again, we've been active, and we see fintech problems everywhere. We look at healthcare. Again, it's hard to find investing opportunities in healthcare, but we see fintech problems everywhere. Um, and so I think fintech will be like, you know, in 1999, there was a lot of talk about internet companies. And now there's zero talk about internet companies. If you said to someone you were running an internet company or starting an internet company, it would just sound goofy. Because, like, show me a company that isn't. And I don't suspect, even in my fondest dreams, that that same status will apply to fintech, where show me a company that isn't. But I do see everywhere I look fintech-style problems. Um, and so I think we'll be having this conference for a few decades yet. Uh, those are my materials. Uh, I would love to turn it open to questions. I think we have 10 minutes. Um, that's the, the setup for questions, okay? That would be ideal. We've got mics yeah. on both stairs. Yeah. If you're stuck in the middle there, ma'am, and you want to just bellow, I'm, I'm good with that. I can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I'll give you permission. <laughs> I will. So crypto, um, I had the great good fortune to be very, very, very good friends with Barry Silbert five years ago. Barry Silbert had a, had a company called Second Market. But on the side, he was doing all these crypto deals, even back then, really Bitcoin, because that's all there was back then. But he invested in Coinbase and Zappo and all these great companies. And he owned almost 1% of all Bitcoin. And I convinced him to move that into an LLC. And we put in a million dollars, and we turned it into something called Digital Currency Group. It wasn't really much of a group. It was just Barry and me doing like seed stage crypto investing five years ago. Um, but that's become a really big business now. So that entity has six or seven hundred million dollars worth of value in it and then has three big wholly owned businesses genesis grayscale and uh, a big event called consensus and a media company called coindesk all in dcg where i um, work in the investment committee and on the board and so through that we've gotten massive exposure to 120 different companies in every corner of crypto and that's been a good seat to be in and we've then directly invested in a few other companies basis which is a stable coin, uh, Compound, which is lending markets in, in the token space, uh, and SeedCX, which is a derivatives platform. So basically, we think of it in three different ways. There's the, is crypto going to be an asset class? There's the, will blockchain, enterprise blockchain, become a new important database type in corporate America? And then there's, will consumers and businesses move to distributed applications? governed by protocols, powered by tokens, instead of buying software from companies? Three big questions. We have reasonable conviction about the first one. So we have made market structure investments that are predicated on the belief that crypto will be an asset class. We have made no investments in enterprise blockchain. And we are looking at a ton of investments in the protocol space, but have been cautious. We do have somebody add a microphone, so I really have to. Somebody obeyed the rules. I have to reward right. them. Um, so 
I work at Deutsche Bank, and so that's probably the context for this question, but where, where do you see are the biggest opportunities for disruption in capital markets? So that's you know the post-trade space, the um, trade financing, yeah. like the, the institutional corporate side of things? Uh, <clears throat> I don't see a lot of investment opportunities for guys like me in capital markets, you know, notwithstanding the fact that I've made a bunch. I find it really hard. It has been like a 10-year drought in terms of like real equity value creation in capital markets tech. Because what you've seen is a shrinking number of participants with shrinking budgets. 12 years ago, if you had something to sell to Deutsche Bank, they would buy it, <laughs> happily buy it. If it, it had a chance of adding you know, alpha or delighting customers and like $250,000 for Deutsche Bank, great, let's do this. Now, forget about it. Uh, and I get it. If I was a shareholder at Deutsche Bank, I, this is a better stance than the former stance. But it's tricky if you're a vendor. Uh, so, you know, fixed income is sort of the, you know, fixed income is the asset class that has both scale and really bad habits that are, you know, durable and ongoing. And so there's definitely companies like TrueMid are finally starting to bring over-the-counter trading and fixed income into marketplaces. And they've got a long way to go and a lot of value to create. Uh, but it's not a major focus of ours. Institutional capital markets is a tough place. Ma'am. From the regulatory point of view, are you seeing many of the fintechs trying to apply for the non back charter or avoiding it altogether? Yeah, I think there are some large, larger fintechs that are interested in uh, the, these novel, lightweight charters, for sure. Um, the problem is there's nothing really to apply for yet. And there's like a federalist battle going on between the states and the federal government about whether the federal government can even do this. The states assert their prerogatives in financial services regulation in a way that I find ridiculous, if there's any state regulators. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that the state should have a voice in what is clearly a national business, but yet they do, and they all really enjoy that power, and they're fighting incredibly hard to keep it. So I don't anticipate that there's going to be a lightweight charter that is actually useful for a long time, if ever. Uh, but I would say the interest is very high. I think. People don't, aren't daunted. These young companies are not daunted by the idea of regulatory oversight. And they feel like they can accommodate that. And they want the access to low cost funding. Um, and so I think there's a real bid for it. But I think it's, the, the, the companies that are going to cross first are going for traditional charters, like Varro on the West Coast. They're just going to become a bank. Um, but they're going to be a very different kind of bank. Um, but I think the new charters are a long, long time coming. Sorry, we've got to go. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah.